Many of these figures were of pure gold inlay, while all the titles were of pure gold inlay but not raised. The tablets were carefully numbered by sets and a serial number given to each set. The dates were represented by wreaths of flowers intertwined with vines and leaves. If we were to record a date like January the 1st, 1894, the first month of the year would be represented by the stem of a flower not yet come into bud inlaid with pure gold jade. The first day of the month would be represented by the stem just coming into bud inlaid with gold. The one of 18 would be represented by the stem with the bud just opened enough to disclose the pistil of the flower. The petals of the flower are lapis luzini, luzuli, I can't pronounce that word, inlay. The pistil being gold inlay with a small diamond set in gold. The eight in the flower is full bloom with eight stamens showing each stamen and inlay of gold around the pistil with a smaller diamond set in the gold inlay. The nine is represented by a rose with nine petals in full bloom, one petal an inlay of lapis luzini, one of jade and one of the chalcedony. This order repeated three times. This shows that the last or the end of the digits was reached, thus they used from zero to nine, then repeated. The four is the lily in the process of opening with the pistol and three stamens showing the bowl of the lily is an inlay of pale jade. The stamens are fire opal set with four small diamonds and the pistol is of lapis lazuli inlay set with four small diamonds. The space given over to the text is outlined with a thread-like vine inlaid with gold, the leaves being inlays of green jade and everything being worked out in perfect detail. Each tablet is a perfect jewel in itself. The type of tablet and the method of dating would indicate early Atlantean. Each tablet would be worth a king's ransom were they offer, offered for sale. As we were musing, the abbot and the priest came up, accompanied by the old lama who had charge of the records. We became so engrossed with his recital of the history that it was necessary for the abbot to call our attention to the fact that the time for our appearance before the Dalai Lama was fast approaching and that we should be in robes ere this. When we arrived at our quarters, we found robes laid out for each of us, but how to put them on was a far uh, facer to us. The time was passing so swiftly that we decided to make a bold, quick try and put them on helter-skelter. It developed later on that some of them were inside out and others backside foremost, while a few had the robes on as they should be. Upon arriving at the audience chamber, we beheld the Dalai Lama crossing the hall with his guard to enter the chamber by the great doors. We were certain we saw a broad smile flit across his face. We composed ourselves at attention to await the opening of the side door, which was our cue to enter the chamber. Soon the door opened and we were ushered in amidst the most gorgeous decorations than it, than it has been our lot to witness. The ceiling of the room terminated in a great dome in the center. In this dome were three large openings through which great beams of sunlight flooded, lighting up the room with a brilliance and a splendor too magnificent for description. The walls were completely covered with gold thread tapestries interlaced with figures made of silver threads. In the center of the room on a raised dais covered with a cloth of spun gold sat the Dalai Lama, dressed in a robe of spun gold trimmed with purple and spun silver cloth. We were conducted before the Dalai Lama by the abbot and the high priest, and as before, they stood at either end of the line. After a word of greeting, the Dalai Lama stepped down from the dais and stood before us. He raised his hands, we knelt, and received his blessing. As we arose, he stepped to our chief, and placing a brooch upon his breast, spoke through the interpreter. This will allow you and your associates the freedom of this land. You may come and go at will, and with it I bestow upon you this commission, which entitles you to the rank of a citizen of Tibet. I confer upon you the title of Lord of the Great Gobi. He then walked down the whole line, placing a smaller but similar brooch upon the breast of each one of the company. Wear this as a token of my esteem. It will admit you to the whole land of Tibet. It is your password wherever you go. 
He took the scroll containing the commission from the hand of the abbot and handed it to our chief. The brooches were beautifully made of gold, wrought in filigree, with the most lifelike likeness of the Dalai Lama carved in relief on jade, set like a cameo in the center. To us it was a jewel which we prized very highly. The Dalai Lama and all were graciousness itself. All we could say was, thank you. The old Lama who had charge of the records was ushered in, and we were informed that we would share the evening meal with the Dalai Lama. After the meal was finished, the conversation drifted to the remarkable tablets. The Dalai Lama, as well as the old Lama, speaking through an interpreter, gave us a detailed account of the history of the tablets, all of which we carefully noted. It seemed that these tablets were discovered by a wandering Buddhist priest in the vaults under the ruins of an old temple in Persia. This priest stated that he was led to them by the sweet song he heard emanating from the ruins as he sat in Shamati. The songs were so sweet and the voice so clear that he finally became interested, following in the direction from whence they came, and found himself within the ruined vault. The voice seemed to come from below. After a thorough inspection, he could find no evidence of an opening, so he determined to locate the source of the, vo of the voice. Securing crude tools, he began digging in the debris and discovered a flagstone that seemed to be only a portion of the floor of the ruined vault. His heart sank in despair as he thought for a time that he had been led from the right path by the whistling through the old ruins. Before leaving the pl place, he sat in meditation for a few moments, and as he sat thus, the voice became more clear and distinct, ending with the injunction to proceed. With almost superhuman effort, he succeeded in removing the large flagstone. This disclosed an opening leading downward. As soon as he stepped through the opening into the passage, it was lighted up as, as by an unseen force. Ahead of him gleamed a bright light. He followed the light, which led him to the opening of a large vault, closed by huge stone doors. As he stood for a moment before these doors, the hinges began to creak and the great stone slab swung slowly, revealing an opening through which he passed. As he crossed the threshold, the voice rang out clear and sweet as though the owner occupied the interior. The light that seemed stationary at the doors moved to the center of the great vault, lighting it fully. There, in niches in the walls of this vault, covered with dust and the accumulation of ages, were the tablets. He inspected a few, realizing their beauty and value, then decided to wait until he could communicate with two or three of his trusted associates and confer with them regarding the removal of the tablets to a place of safety. He left the vault, replaced the slab, and covered it over again with the debris, then started on a quest for associates who could believe his story and who had the fortitude and the means to carry out his plan. The quest lasted for over three years. Nearly all those to whom he related his story thought he had gone stark mad. Finally, one day while on a pilgrimage, he came across three priests whom he had known while on a similar pil pil pilgrimage, and he told them the story. At first they were very skeptical, but one evening at exactly nine, as they were sitting around the campfire, the voice began to sing of these records. The next day the four of them dropped out of the company and started the journey to the ruins. For that time on, at nine o'clock in the evening, the voice would sing. If they were weary and downcast, the voice would sing all the sweeter. At the journey's end, as they were approaching the ruins an hour before midday, a slight boyish form appeared before them and began singing, leading the way to the ruins. When they arrived, the flagstone was lifted and they went immediately to the vault. As they approached, the door swung open and they entered. A short examination convinced the priest of the value and truth of the discovery. Indeed, so enraptured were they that they did not sleep for three days. They made ha all haste to a village about 70 miles distant to secure camels and supplies which would enable them to move the tablets to a place of greater safety. They finally secured 12 camels, loaded them, and returned. The tablets were packed in such a manner that they would not be injured. Securing three more camels, they started the long journey through Persia and Afghanistan to Persia.